Well, good afternoon and welcome to The Odd Hoenn Show. The big controversy right now seems to be the question of whether or not you should get the COVID-19 vaccine. And I'm not going to weigh in particularly on that question. I think people need to make their own decisions and need to be free to make their own decisions in accordance with their own values in that regard. Uh, but what I do want to talk about is the process of risk assessment uh, as it's commonly applied in engineering and finance and how we might adapt that process to considering a question like this of whether or not to get a vaccine, whether it's uh, the COVID vaccine that everyone's talking about right now or something else that maybe we'll be talking about in the future. Okay, so the premise of just about any standard risk assessment is that risk is defined as the product of probability times consequence. So, you know, maybe you've got a particular financial venture that has a 10% probability of losing $10,000. Uh, so to calculate the risk, you multiply 10% or 0 0.1 by $10,000, you get $1,000. And so that is the risk of that particular investment. Uh, if you had a 10% chance of gaining $10,000, then the mathematics is the same, just with opposite sign. It's a, a benefit rather than a risk. So we call that expected value. And so you'll see these analyses called by a variety of names, uh, risk analysis, expected value analysis, risk benefit analysis, um, but it's all basically the same concept of probability times consequence. So the way that this works for making a decision is that you consider each possible decision you could make, each scenario that you can choose between, and you calculate all of the risks for each scenario, and you add them up to get a total risk for each scenario, and then you select the one that has the least risk or the most expected value, the most benefit, if there is one that has a positive expected value. So the stereotypical illustration of this would be something like playing the lottery. You know, you've got two choices. Either you can choose to play the lottery or you can choose not to play the lottery. If you buy a lottery ticket, we'll just say that the ticket costs $10 and it gives you a one in a million chance of winning $1 million. So we calculate the risk for each of those scenarios. If you choose not to play the lottery, then the risk computes to zero because there's no probability of you either gaining or losing anything through the lottery if you don't play it in the first place. If you do buy the lottery ticket, then your net risk or your net expected value would be negative $10 times 100% probability because that's the cost of the ticket and you're going to pay that if you buy the ticket, uh, plus $1 million multiplied by a one in a million chance of getting it, or net uh, expected value of $1. So we add those two together and, and we get a net expected value of negative $9 or a net risk of losing $9. And so in this case, playing the lottery has a greater risk associated with it than not playing the lottery, and so we'd probably choose not to play it. Now, if the ticket price dropped to, say, 50 cents, then that would compute to a positive expected value of 50 cents to play it, and so the assessment would lead you to buy the lottery ticket. So that is the classic risk assessment methodology. You know, you calculate the probability times the consequence, you add them up for each choice that you can make or each scenario that you can choose between, and then you pick the one with the most expected benefit or the least risk. The problem with this approach is that it only works when you can confidently quantify both the probability and the expected uh, benefit or loss for each of the outcomes in each of the given situations. So it's easy to apply a classical risk assessment to gambling where you know the odds, 
or to financial ventures where you've done your market research and you have a, a pretty good idea of what the expected values of each uh, possibility are, uh, or engineering scenarios where you have a good mathematical model of you know that you can use to predict outcomes, uh, you know, given a finite set of inputs. But what do you do when you've got something like a medical procedure where, you know, there's some uncertainty in the probabilities and the outcomes are things that you can't really put a dollar value on? Well, one option that I see used surprisingly often in engineering is that if you don't have good data to do your risk assessment, if you don't have hard numbers for the values to put in, then you just kind of make up values to put into the risk assessment and you fudge the numbers to make the outcome of the risk assessment fit with your intuition. But at that point, it seems to me like it would be more ethical just to say you're making a recommendation or a decision based on your engineering intuition and leave off your fictitious risk assessment. But probably the better option, in my view, would be instead of pretending to do a classical risk assessment that you don't really have data to do, transition to doing what I would call a binary risk assessment. So the key to doing a binary risk assessment is that instead of trying to put numbers on all the probabilities, uh, you treat them as booleans. You know, every risk is either plausible or implausible. Now, plausible doesn't mean it's necessarily going to happen, it just means it could happen. And implausible doesn't necessarily mean that it is mathematically impossible. It doesn't mean that the probability is identically zero, but what it means is that the probability is low enough that nobody's really concerned about it. Uh, you know, in a, in a project setting, you'd say that if all your stakeholders agree that it's nothing to worry about, then you can treat it as implausible in your binary risk assessment. Um, so, you know, you'll consider all the possible outcomes. You'll decide which of the risks are plausible versus implausible. You'll eliminate all of the implausible ones. And then for each scenario, you'll come up with sort of a worst case outcome. You know, if we make this decision and all of the plausible risks are fully realized, then, you know, what would that worst case situation look like? And then you look at those worst case outcomes for each decision you could make and you decide which is the best overall outcome or which is the least bad. You know, which of these worst case scenarios would be the easiest to live with. And so a binary risk assessment definitely involves a measure of intuition, you know, more so than a classical risk assessment, but it still provides more of a systematic way to think through the issue and be able to explain your reasoning objectively than just fudging the numbers in a classical risk assessment so that it agrees with a decision that was made entirely at the intuitive level. Okay, so now that we've laid out sort of the theoretical groundwork here, let's get back to the vaccination question and talk through some examples of how we can apply a binary risk assessment to this question. As a hypothetical scenario, let's assume that there's some disease out there that's generally not fatal. Uh, if you get it, you will probably make a full recovery, but you'll be miserable for several weeks while you have it. Uh, let's further assume that there's a vaccine that has come out uh, that does provide immunity to this disease, but there's also a couple of disturbing rumors circulating with regards to this new vaccine. For one thing, we'll say that the financial backers of the company that developed this hypothetical vaccine uh, have gone on record as saying that they're concerned about global overpopulation and they believe in controlling the overpopulation problem through vaccines. And so based on their statements, uh, the rumor is that this new vaccine that they've sponsored development of is actually designed to cause sterility. 
the other rumor is that the vaccine is prepared through unethical methods. You know, I don't know, maybe they're harvesting stem cells from aborted babies and using them to uh, mutate your DNA or, or something equally unethical and creepy. And furthermore, we'll assume that all of the actual, you know, technical production data and test data for the development of this vaccine is being guarded as a trade secret, and so there's no way to definitively either substantiate or refute either of these rumors. And of course, I realize that, you know, in real life, any vaccine or other medicine is going to have more than one possible side effect that you'd want to consider. But uh, for the sake of our hypothetical scenario, to keep it simple, we'll keep it to just these factors. So let's say our first hypothetical person is an elderly person with tremendous faith in the integrity of the medical and political institutions of the land. And so he does his uh, binary risk assessment. He says, well, you know, the uh, allegations about, you know, this vaccine being prepared by unethical methods just don't fit with my beliefs about, you know, the integrity of the system. I can't imagine that they would actually allow that. So I'm going to consider that as an implausible risk. And as far as it causing sterility, well, I'm too old to have children anyway, so I don't care about that. Uh, and so the risk of getting the vaccine to him seems, you know, tolerable, seems very low. On the other hand, the risk of not getting it, uh, well, you know, just being miserable for a few weeks is bad enough, but, you know, maybe he's old enough and frail enough that, you know, he's also concerned about, even if the disease doesn't kill him, which it probably won't, it might lead to complications, you know, infections or other things that could be fatal. And so, you know, he does his assessment and says, okay, worst case scenario, if I get the vaccine is uh, not really anything. And worst case scenario, if I don't get it is I'm dead. And so he's going to choose to get the vaccine. Now suppose you've got another hypothetical individual who is, you know, younger, uh, still potentially in a position to have children, and is, you know, very socially minded, but doesn't have as much confidence in the current administration or the integrity of the, the medical systems or the pharmaceutical companies and their financial backers. And so as he does his binary risk assessment, uh, you know, he assesses not only the risk to him personally, but to society in general. And so, you know, he looks at it as, okay, if I don't get the vaccine, then worst case scenario, not only will I get sick, but then, you know, the virus will spread from me to my family to other people. And so, you know, most of society potentially will get sick in a worst case scenario. Uh, and if people are you know, too sick to go to work for a while, that could negatively impact the economy. You know, and so you know, from his perspective, there's still a pretty significant negative outcome to not getting the vaccine. On the other hand, if he does get it, uh, you know, and we'll say that in this scenario, he doesn't quite buy the allegation about the vaccine being prepared by unethical methods. You know, uh, he, he, that just doesn't seem credible to him. So again, he writes that off as being implausible, but he can't quite write off the uh, sterility concern. You know, these financial backers are openly pushing for population control. He's not at all sure that they're actually behind engineering this virus to cause sterility, but it's something he can't rule out. So, well, in that case, you know, what's the worst case scenario if that is the case? Not only does it mean that he's not going to have any more children, but if everybody follows his lead, if everybody gets the vaccine, then nobody's going to have any more children. And so society itself is going to collapse within another generation. And so as bad as the scenario of everybody getting sick is, the scenario of everybody getting vaccinated is even worse. And so he's going to choose not to get the vaccine because of the risks involved. 
So then maybe we have a third hypothetical person who's very religious. And so, you know, when he does his binary risk assessment, you know, he considers that, well, okay, if I don't get the vaccine, then worst case scenario, I get sick, maybe a bunch of other people get sick, we suffer for a while, and then we get over it and go on with life. Well, uh, you know, we're all going to suffer in life, you know, that's something we can deal with. Uh, and even if it kills me, you know, my eternal salvation is secure. So the risk of not getting the vaccine to him seems really pretty small. Uh, whereas the risk of getting the vaccine, uh, on the one hand, you've got the moral risk of, uh, you know, becoming party to this unethical process that is allegedly harvesting cells from aborted babies and perhaps incentivizing abortion and so on and so forth. And, you know, he looks at those accusations and, you know, he knows they may or may not be true, but he can't rule them out. So he's going to treat them as a plausible risk. And to him, the spiritual consequences of becoming party to the mass murder of infants uh, are far more severe than any physical consequence to his health could be. So on that grounds alone, uh, he's going to refuse the vaccine uh, simply because, you know, the moral risk is completely unacceptable, while the physical risk of not getting the vaccine is really not that bad in his view. So hopefully this discussion serves to illustrate the concept of a binary risk assessment and how it can be used to make decisions like whether or not to get a particular vaccine or other medical procedure or really any decision that involves risks that are difficult to quantify. Uh, anyway, until next time, thank you for watching The Idahoan Show.